Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array. This vast collection of dishes is among the most accomplished telescopes in history and one of the most recognizable. These radio telescopes, rising like giant flowers from the New Mexico desert, are monuments to human ingenuity. How are you going to convince your people to allow Americans to go on the flight? We are going to get there first, and you have the knowledge. The heavens and the earth. for the meaning. Well, what is the meaning? We have mindless jobs. We take frantic vacations, deficit finance trips to the, to the mall to buy more things that we think are going to fill these, these holes in our lives. The VLA is the foremost astronomical instrument of its kind. Set within the natural beauty of an ancient lake bed, these dishes tower like sentinels over the desert floor. The Very Large Array didn't get its name by accident. Each of its antennas stands 94 feet tall, with dishes stretching 25 meters or 82 feet in diameter. They are spread across the desert in a Y pattern, up to 13 miles in each direction. Combined, they form a single giant telescope larger than all of New York City. This massive synchronized system monitors the cosmos day and night. The VLA's enormous size is necessary for the unique kind of light that it observes. Our eyes see only a small sliver of the light that reaches us from space. But objects throughout the universe emit light across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. At the long wavelength end of the spectrum is radio light. Because its wavelengths are so long, making sharp pictures from radio light requires a telescope that is miles wide. This invisible light reveals the birth of stars, the secrets of ancient galaxies, and the presence of black holes. On Earth, this extremely weak light must be distinguished from thousands of other man-made sources of radio interference. The entire array has also recently undergone a complete reinvention on a massive scale. After decades of stunning science, the 1980 vintage VLA was in danger of becoming obsolete. Without the resources to construct a new instrument from scratch, NRAO devised a strategy to rebuild the telescope from the inside out. We were able to conceive of a plan that would keep all the antennas the same, keep the rail tracks, keep the infrastructure that uh, supports this instrument, but completely rebuild the electronics. Over the course of a decade, crews have worked to replace nearly all of the technology inside the telescope creating a new instrument within its original skeleton. At the center of the VLA expansion project is the development of a new supercomputer called the Correlator. In a meticulously controlled clean room environment, this incredible machine contributed by Canada turns 27 radio dishes into one gigantic telescope. Huge data streams from each antenna are fed to the telescope's control building, where the correlator increases the telescope's capabilities more than 2,000-fold. After a 10-year effort, the reinvention of the VLA is finally complete.
not only do the VLA's antennas move to track objects in the sky, they also move throughout the array itself on the backs of custom-built antenna transporters. Engineers maneuver these 90-ton flatbed locomotives underneath the antenna's triangular base. 230 tons of steel and sensitive electronics is hoisted into the air and the 94-foot tall structure is slowly unveiled. The antenna's sheer size makes transporting it a potential hazard. The crew cannot move antennas in winds of more than 20 miles per hour. And maximum speed is just under 5 miles an hour. The array is crisscrossed by more than 40 miles of railway lines. The antennas are moved along tracks that lead 13 miles out from the center of the array to 72 separate antenna stations. These stations are connected to the main track by perpendicular spurs. When the transporter reaches the desired station, engineers use hydraulic jacks to pick up its wheel trucks independently and rotate them 90 degrees to make the turn. They carefully set the structure down and the upgraded antenna makes its new home in the vast array. About every four months, the antennas are moved into one of four different configurations, A through D. Each configuration changes the depth and detail the telescope sees. Combining data from all four configurations delivers the best image quality. When the antennas are packed together in the D configuration, the telescope can see faintly glowing clouds of gas. When they are at their farthest distance from each other in the A configuration, they reveal the finest details of the radio universe. The world's most storied radio telescope prepares to once again open its eyes on the universe. Copy that. We're getting ready to run the C-band observation. The antennas turn toward the southern sky. In the darkness above, the light that left Hanai's 210 some 30 million years ago finally approaches our Earth. It has traveled more than 150 quintillion miles and persevered through gas and dust to share its secret. The VLA's dishes lock onto the faint beam of light coming from Hanai's 210. The radio emissions flood the telescope. And for a few short hours, two distant realms share a fleeting connection. An entirely new catalog of human knowledge is captured and recorded. And this 21st century astronomical instrument plays its part in a human journey that began many ages ago. After six hours, the telescope moves on to a different target. But the secrets from the distant galaxy have been saved on a microscopic scale. Like messages in an ancient language, they must be deciphered. Our team just finished reducing all of our new data and we have some spectacular images now and we can do a very detailed comparison between the optical data from the Hubble Space Telescope, the infrared data from the Hubble Space Telescope and now the radio data from the VLA. 
The VLA observations reveal a tantalizing discovery. We found this source of radio emission that looked very much like it might be a supermassive black hole in this tiny little galaxy. Deep in this dwarf galaxy, less than 30 times smaller than our Milky Way, a hulking giant is feeding on the surrounding gas. This has implications for our understanding of the evolution of galaxies and their black holes, and even the formation of the first black holes back in the early universe. The VLA data here is really crucial for this discovery, and it would not have happened without it. Discoveries like those unveiled by Henai's 210 are being made with increasing frequency as astronomers make use of ever more powerful instruments. On the upper right, we have Centaurus A. I believe all mankind has that innate desire to know the origins of his being. Astronomers from all over the world want to use the VLA to uncover the secrets of the universe. We are adding more and more to our understanding of the universe. You don't have to be a scientist to be thrilled by that. We've always had the night sky to look at, to ask questions about, and to wonder why it looks the way it does. The iron that's in your blood, the calcium that's in your teeth, all those things were made inside those stars. And the fact that like say we're pointing at a what I think is a cute radio star, a cute radio star, and then the as the star emits the light, it comes um, through here, through the atmosphere, and it bounces off the big bowl dish, which we call the primary, and then it goes to the secondary, which is at the top of those four pillars. Um, and the secondary reflector actually has a dent in one side, and that dent um, sort of channels the light into one of the bongo drums you see at the center of it. Um, those bongo, bongo drums are actually called receivers. It's kind of hard to tell from here, but the tallest one I think is about seven feet tall and about this big in diameter. And the smallest one is about this big in diameter and about this tall. And you can think of those as the sort of colors we see in the radio. Montana, I keep forgetting to emphasize this, but every t there's a vertex rim underneath. Mm -hmm. So the tallest one is probably seven feet from what you see, but it's like 14 feet tall in total. Oh, okay. Because um, like half of it is still under there. Yeah, I do like part of it was still. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> and then it goes through the receivers, or no, through the electronics at the end of the receivers. And from there, it's sent through fiber optics to the control building, and in the control building we have what I call a black magic machine. Um, it's actually called a WIDAR correlator, and it's a supercomputer. We have 27 antennas, and then we combine the signal, but we, c we care about the pairs of antennas, and it's every possible pair. So for example, for antenna one, it's uh, paired with antenna two, antenna three, and so forth. So for a total of 27 antennas, that's a total of 351 pairs. And so for every um, observation and for everything we record, we had to do 351 calculations so that we can eventually combine it into our pretty pictures. Um, and that's what the correlator does, is it combines all those uh, signals. And then it's sent to um, our archive in Socorro. And the humming noise is actually the uh, cryogenics to keep the electronics very cold. We keep it at about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty chilly. So is this right now like moving or just static? So it kind of depends. So it is tracking the source across the sky a little bit. However, um, the other interesting thing about radio observations is, so we don't observe in the same method as like optical. And the reason why is because of electronics. So the electronics actually cause like different types of noise, like random noise, but it changes throughout the observation. So what we actually do is we look at our uh, calibrator and then we look at our science packet, and then we look at our calibrator. We do this about every couple of minutes. 
So it'll actually come into this dam as it tries to source across the sky. Are they in an array yet, or are they just sort of randomly placed? So uh, you're visiting during a really interesting time because we're actually in the middle of changing the configuration. So part of the array is still an A configuration, which is why there's some all the way over there and all the way over there and all the way over there. But then uh, the other part of the um, array is in D configuration, which is why there's a lot more right here. Um, and so we started moving last week, and it'll take about two weeks to move from A to D fully. Um, and does it just go A, B, C, D, and then repeat itself? Yep. How long does it take to repeat each one? It depends. So these antennas are um, 230 tons. The transporters themselves weigh about 190 tons. And so the transporters with an antenna move at a whopping speed of two miles per hour. And so when you're going down um, 11 miles of track, it takes a bit. <laughs> As far as you were concerned. Uh, right. Um, but the idea with the NGBLA is to have that one that's powered. It's easier to deal with when they're further apart because only one or two of the antennas will pick that's it up. True. Right. And it'll kind of cancel itself out by the time it gets combined. Yeah. Um, when they're close together, though, it's tricky because then they'll all pick it up. Yeah. And it all just kind of depends on how bright it is. Um, it's a problem, but we make the, the. You make the best of it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we can technically like draw out chunks of the spectrum. So when you look at your data, you often look at it as like frequency and, and all your time. So like if there's um, like a satellite or something, usually it's just in the small portion of the frequency and you can kind of just yeah, cut it all out. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.